hope you enjoy today's message on Acts chapter 2 verse 38 preaching channel. Please like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to help us grow. How many come expecting God to do something great today? I believe that God wants to help us. Second Samuel chapter 9, we'll begin reading at verse number 6. The Bible says, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father. I want you to notice what he said, And thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said unto him, I have given unto thy master's son all that pertain to Saul and to all his house. Thou therefore and thy sons and thy servants shall till the land for him, and thou shalt bring in the fruits that thy master's son may have food to eat But Mephibosheth, thy master's son, shall eat bread alway at my table. Now Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Then said Ziba unto the king, according to all that my lord the king hath commanded his servant, so shall thy servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. And Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah, and all that dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants unto Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he did eat continually at the king's table and was lame on both his feet. David said, Mephibosheth, you don't have to wander any longer. You don't have to hang out in Lodabar any longer. But I've got a seat for you at my table, and it's got your name on it. If the Holy Ghost would help us for the next few moments, I want to preach to you from this thought. A seat with your name on it. A seat with your name on it. Would you set your Bibles down? Let's pray together and ask that God would be with us for the next few minutes here. Jesus, we love you. God, I praise you. I worship you. I'm asking that you would help us lips of clay. You would anoint our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, and our minds to understand. And we will not fail to give you praise and glory and honor that you alone are worthy of today. We love you. We praise you. We worship you today. Would you clap your hands one more time unto the Lord and give him praise. He's worthy. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, Lord. I worship you. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Thank you for standing. I want to take a moment of this morning to give us a backdrop to the setting of our text. Our Bible has many examples about friendships and relationships. You don't have to go very far into the pages of Genesis where you will see the friendship and relationship between Abraham and Lot. We read about Ruth and Naomi in your Bible. You will read about Elijah and Elisha, Job and his friends. You read about Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The Bible tells us about the friendship and the relationship that Jesus had with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Paul's relationship with Priscilla and Aquila, and then Paul and Timothy. However, when I think of friendships today, and I think of relationships in the Bible, probably the first one that comes to my mind is that between Jonathan, the son of Saul, and David. From the outside looking in, these were seemingly polar opposites. David was a shepherd boy and Jonathan was a prince. David had a harp, a staff, and a sling while Jonathan 
had some of the greatest armor that was known to man at that time. David grew up in the little town of Bethlehem, and Jonathan grew up in the palace and was trained in the art of war. David was the youngest of eight boys and anointed the next king in place of Jonathan. Jonathan was the oldest son and in line to inherit the throne. David was of the tribe of Judah, and Jonathan was of the tribe of Benjamin. Yet in spite of their differences, they were some of the best friends that this world has ever known. Their first meeting, no doubt, probably took place in the palace as David was called upon to play a harp to soothe a tormented King Saul. And after he would play his harp, David would leave the palace and he would head for the hills where he would tend to his father's sheep. But it probably wasn't until David stood in the valley of Elah with Goliath's head in his hand that he returned and Abner brought him before Saul with Goliath's head still in his hand and they had a conversation in the Bible lets us know in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 1 that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul and so here an unlikely friendship begins David a musician and a giant slayer, a warrior by day and a songwriter by night. Jonathan had this great admiration for this young man that was probably, as some believe, 10 years younger than himself. David could sue the king, defeat an enemy, and shepherd sheep. It was in 1 Samuel chapter 18 that we see Jonathan and David began to make a covenant and Jonathan strips himself of his robe, his, his garment, even his sword, his bow, and his girdle. A friendship had been born that was stronger than blood, and David would do whatever Saul sent him to do, and eventually he would become a leader over men. All this was well with Saul and Jonathan and David. But as fate would have it, David returns from slaughtering the Philistines one day, and the women began to sing and dance before Saul, saying, Saul has slain his thousands. Saul gets excited. They're singing about me. They're, they're talking about my greatness. But the very next line of the song says, David has slain his ten thousands. Saul is wroth and thinking to himself, the only thing left for David to have is my kingdom. And he eyed David from that day forward. Ride with me a few minutes here. You can't help but wonder what Jonathan was feeling in this moment. He was in line to be the next king, yet the people loved David. He, he's a hero, but there was something in Jonathan's spirit that I love. You, you do not find him getting jealous, nor do you find him getting envious or feeling threatened. But I believe that there was a discernment in Jonathan that realized there is something unique about David. There is a special anointing that is on his life and the call of God is on his life. And instead of getting jealous, instead of getting envious, instead of running him down, Jonathan determined, I'm going to connect with David. I'm going to ride with David because if the hand of God is upon David, I want to be around him. Let, let me stop long enough to preach to somebody on this Sunday morning. It's not time to get jealous or envious when your brother slays a giant or is celebrated when someone else sings the special or is used in ways that you thought you should have. You thought you were next in line, but let me preach to you today. It's time to rejoice with them. It's time to celebrate with them. It's time to connect with them because there's going to come a day you're going to slay a giant and I'm going to rejoice with you. You're it's time to get linked up with somebody that's doing it right, saying, hey, David, if the call of God is on you, I'm going to support you. I'm going to have your back because I'm hoping that that same anointing is going to get all over me and God is going to use me to bring about a victory. And so now you have David. 
He's a fugitive. He's running for his life. Saul expresses his desire to kill David. And Jonathan loved David. And he goes and he finds him. And he tells him of his plan. You, you've got to stay here. You've got to hide yourself. My father wants to kill you. My, my father wants to take your life. And, and Jonathan runs back to his father. And he begins to intercede with him for David. And, and once again, David is brought into the presence of Saul. But it didn't take very long for that evil spirit to get on Saul and he finds a javelin and he, he throws a javelin at David and David escapes and is on the run yet again. And it was during this time that Jonathan and David meet up and, and they make covenant with one another yet again. And, and David says, I'm going to show you kindness unto thee and to thy seed. And, and Jonathan said to David, go in peace. We have sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord be between me and thee and between thy seed and my seed forever and he arose and they departed and Jonathan went his way and, and David is spending his life in caves and in the wilderness yet through it all this unlikely friendship Jonathan finds time for David and they comfort one another in 1 Samuel 26 we finally see Saul lamenting that he has sinned and, and David is brought with Saul before Saul with a promise. You're not going to die at my hand. It's going to be all right. And it was just a few chapters later in 1 Samuel 31 that David returns from Ziglag to the news that Saul and his best friend Jonathan have both died. He, he rents his clothes. He mourns and he cries aloud. And we fast forward to our text this morning. Thank you for bearing with me today. Second Samuel chapter 9. And David is now in the palace. I, I don't know what he was doing. I, I don't know what his day was like that day. But he's sitting there and he's reminiscing about his friendship with Jonathan. He, he's reminiscing about the good days. And he's reminiscing about the bad Bad days. He, he's thinking about the days that he was in the cave, and he's thinking about playing the harp to soothe the, in the palace to, to soothe King Saul, and he's thinking about the dodging the javelin here as well. And he begins to wonder. I, I just wonder if there's anybody left of the house of Saul. Saul has died, and his boys have died. Uh, who is there? And David just throws a question out and, and says, Is there anyone left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And, and Ziba comes running forward, Saul's servant, and says, I don't know if you know this, but Jonathan had a little boy. And he's still alive. But you've got to know something about him. He's lame on his feet. For at the death of Saul and Jonathan, all of their family members fled and for fear. And Mephibosheth, he was just a five-year-old boy. And his nurse was carrying him out. And they were running. And, and she dropped him. He knew nothing but the palace. And, and now he's crippled. And David asked the question, where, where does this Mephibosheth live? And well, for the last 15 years, he's been living in a refugee city called Lodabar. It, it's a barren place. It's a, a place that has no future and a, a place that has no hope. A, a place where he was going to die a lonely death uh, where no one would know his name and, or that he was royal and nobody would know what he was about. Uh, he was crippled. He was broken. He was destitute. I'm going to preach to somebody today. Uh, nobody had use uh, for a young man with a little bit of power. He was lame on his feet. What's this about lameness? Lameness, it's among the imperfections that would bar a descendant of Aaron from entering the holy place. If you were lame, you couldn't go in to offer sacrifice. You couldn't go into the holy place. Lameness was some heavy baggage for anybody to deal with. Yet King David looked at Ziba and said, I know that he's lame. I know that he's crippled. I know that he's messed up. But I want you to go get Mephibosheth. I want you to bring him to me because I want to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. 
David's question was not, is there anyone that's deserving? Is there anyone that's sharp? Is there anyone that's strong? Is there anyone that has it all together? But his question simply was, is there anyone? I don't care what they look like. I don't care if they live in Lodabar. I don't care if they live in a barren place. I don't care if they have a checkered past or if they're over 50 pounds on their baggage. Whosoever will, let them come because I have a seat with their name on it. They're welcome to walk into the king's house whenever they want to come. Ziba's answer was, uh, yes, there's someone, uh, but he's crippled. Uh, You wouldn't want him around here. Uh, He's not like the rest of us. Uh, I'm preaching to you today. Uh, He's kind of odd. Uh, He's a misfit. Uh, He doesn't wear custom suits. Uh, And she doesn't wear fancy dresses. Uh, They don't live in a nice house. Uh, They don't drive a nice car. Uh, He's an outcast. Uh, He's just there. Uh, But David said, uh, you go to Lodabar. Uh, You go to the barren place you go to the destitute and you get him and you bring him foot to me I'm not showing him kindness because of anything Mephibosheth has done it's not of any of his own righteousness but I'm showing him kindness for the sake of his father Jonathan David said I've been waiting for this moment I kept a seat open that had his name on it because I just had a feeling I made a covenant with Jonathan on the backside of a hill a long time ago that said I'm going to take care of your seed. It doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter how messed up they've been. I've got a table that is spread and I've always got room for one more. I've come to preach to somebody on a Sunday morning. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you're messed up and living in Lodabar. There's always room for one more. There's a- I've got a priest to summon in today. You feel like you don't deserve a seat, but there's a seat with your name on it. And you come on a Sunday morning and his arms are open wide saying, come on. You see this seat? It's got your name on it. I've been saving it for you. So Mephibosheth, he walks in. He falls on his face before David. And David said, get up. Fear not. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be afraid any longer. You may have run because I was king. But it's okay. I'm going to show you kindness for Jonathan, thy father's sake. And you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to restore thee all the land of Saul, thy father. And Mephibosheth, I'm going to make you a promise today. You see that seat right there? It has your name on it, and you're going to eat at my table continually. You won't have to worry about where your next meal is going to come from. You won't have to worry about who's going to take care of you. I've been waiting for this moment, and I'm here to celebrate Mephibosheth, your home. You're back where you belong. You were in the palace for five years, but you've been destitute for 15. But come on home baby there's a seat with your name on it and Mephibosheth David said to David you don't understand I'm a dead dog I'm worthless I know your eyes aren't that bad but but can't you see I'm crippled I'm messed up I'm undeserving I'm broken. I have no family left. And David said, no son, you're one of mine now. You're going to eat at my table. You've got royal blood flowing through your veins. I don't care what they say about you. You're always welcome here. I don't care about the lameness. It's not going to bar you from an altar of repentance. You're welcome at the king's table. And you know what, Ziba, you were Saul's servant, and I've given to Mephibosheth everything that pertains to your master. You're going to till the land for him. 
you're going to bring the fruit for him. He's never going to have to worry. Your master's son is going to have food to eat and he's going to be at my table. He's not a dead dog to me, but he's been grafted in. He's an adopted son whereby we cry, Abba, Father. He is one of us and he has a seat here continually. I want to preach to somebody today. I don't know where you come from. I don't know what lie the enemy has told you that says you're not welcome here. You hear this preacher today? There's a seat with your name on it and you're welcome at the king's table whenever you want. I've got to hurry today. I want you to imagine dinner that night at the palace. Here comes clever Amnon. Here comes beautiful Tamar. Here comes brilliant Solomon and handsome Absalom. Here comes brave Joab. And then here comes a crippled, lame, broken, messed up Mephibosheth. He awkwardly finds his place at the table. But all of a sudden that tablecloth. It covers his feet. It covers his imperfections. It covers his brokenness. Who is this new guy at the table? We've never seen him before. I don't know. Maybe they noticed his crippled feet. Maybe they noticed there were some things that were different about him. Does he belong here? Does he fit in with us? But David made it clear. He said, kids, I want you to know that as long as I'm king, Mephibosheth, you will always have a place at my table. You will always have a seat. You may feel unworthy. You may feel undeserving. Others may think you don't belong here. But Mephibosheth, that seat, it has your name on it. And you can sit there whenever you want for however long you want to sit there. Because at the king's table, your lameness is covered. At the king's table, your brokenness is covered. At the king's table, your past no longer holds you hostage. We're all the same. We're one of his sons. We're one of his daughters. And we've got royalty on us. I've come to preach to somebody today that is struggling with your place in the kingdom. You are allowing lameness to control the narrative of your life. You're allowing it to control your future. But I've come to bring hope to you on a Sunday morning for the next few moments here that you have a future at the king's table. You have a seat at the king's table. You are welcome to sit here when you want. Let me preach to you that the king's table is not just reserved for those that are perfect. Those that have it all together, all dialed in. The right last name, a certain social status, come from a perfect home. But but let me preach to you on a Sunday morning. Let me preach to you, sir, today. Let me preach to you today, ma'am, who has a future and who has a seat at the king's table. The crippled, they've got a seat at the table. The lame, the broken. The messed up, the checkered past, the outcast, the drunk, the druggie, the pregnant teenage girl. She's got a seat with her name on it. The aimless teenage boy, he's got a seat with his name on it. I'm preaching to you today. Did not the master say in Luke 14, go to the highways, go to the byways, go to the hedge. Compel them to come. The table has a spot for whosoever will. got to preach to a spirit and an attitude that likes to find its way into the church that wants to regulate who has a spot at the table. Zeba, he was typical of some of us. Yes, there is a son, but I've got to describe this son for you. He's crippled. Yes, Jonathan's got a boy, but but there's something you got to know about him. He's lame on his feet. I've got to preach against that spirit today. It's not my job, and it's not your job to dictate who has a seat with your name on it. You know what my job is? Whosoever will. 
I'm going to the highways, whosoever will. I'm going to the byways, whosoever will. I'm going to the hedge, whosoever will. You've got a seat with your name on it. I don't care the color of their skin. I don't care what they look like. I don't care what they smell like. Come on, baby. Come on home. Well, they've got a checkered past, Brother Brown. I think I read in my Bible that Paul persecuted the Christians. He held the coats of them that stoned Stephen. You want to tell him to give up his seat? I'm not doing it. Well, I heard they're liars and they're cheaters. You want to say goodbye to Peter and Jacob and tell them to give up their seat at the table? They're drunk. They've got a problem with alcohol. Noah, you want to give up your seat? Moses, you're a murderer. you got to pack your bags and go. You've got immorality issues. See you later, David. See you later, Rahab. See you later, woman at the well. You've got to give up your seat. You hear me today? Don't misunderstand me. Don't misconstrue anything I say. I believe in the sinfulness of sin but I also believe in a place called Mount Calvary I also believe in a place of mercy and whosoever will let them come James said it like this mercy rejoiceth against judgment one said it like this mercy will always triumph over judgment or exalt itself above judgment I'm not here to advocate your sin but I'm here to tell you that if you've sinned if you've made a mistake if you failed there is an altar that's got a tablecloth spread and it will cover your mistake It will cover your failure. There is blood that can be applied to your life. (laughs) I'm hurrying musicians come. Let me preach to you today, young person. You have a seat with your name on it. Let me preach to you today, saint of God. You have a seat with your name on it. Visitor friend, I I don't know your name today, but but he does. and, And there's a seat with your name on it. Well, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know the mess that I've gotten myself into. There's a place called repentance. There's something called mercy. And just as a tablecloth covers your lame feet, mercy and the blood will cover your mistakes, your failure, and your sin. I preach it to somebody today. Who feels like you've disqualified yourself from the table. You hear me, your disappointments don't have to define you. Your brokenness doesn't have to be your battlefield forever. Your failure doesn't have to be your future. But on this Sunday morning, it's time to get up. And it's time to find an altar of repentance. And let mercy be applied to your life. And take a seat at the king's table. You have a future here. I'm preaching to somebody today that you walk through those back doors with guilt and shame. Praying to God that nobody ever finds out what you've done and where you've been. But I've come to preach to you today that the devil would like to lie to you and trick you into believing that because of your lameness, that because you live in Lodabar, you live in a barren place, because you're an outcast, that you have to be like that for the rest of your life. I've come to preach against that lie today and tell you I don't care if you're lame. I don't care if you're broken. I don't care what you did last night, last week, last month, or last year. The Holy Ghost sent a preacher here to tell you today that if you'll find an altar of repentance, if you'll let his mercy be applied, you'll go down in the waters of baptism. I've got a seat that I've been holding for you. 
I've got a seat that has your name. I know, I know they say you don't deserve it. I know family and friends said, no, you don't deserve to sit at the king's table. But I hear the king saying, go get Mephibosheth. I don't care where he's living. I don't care what he looks like now. I know he was just five years old when he left the palace, and and he's probably 20 years old now. Just go get Mephibosheth because I've got a seat that I've been holding for him. Sir, let me tell you today, there's a seat that the king's been holding for you. Ma'am, there's a seat that the king's been holding for you. I, I failed too many times. No. There's mercy and there's blood that can be applied to your life today. Everybody standing. I refuse to be the one that says there's no room here. I've had my fair share of mistakes. I've failed too many times to count. I've disappointed too many people. I'm not perfect. And by some accounts, I shouldn't be here today. But thank God for mercy. Thank God for his love. Thank God for his blood. It's not my job to dictate who has a spot today. No, you can't sit there. You've got to stand in the back corner and and pray your little prayer back there. You, You can't come up here. No, that's not my job. Ziba, is there anyone left of the house of Saul? Ziba, all your answer had to be was yes. Jonathan has a boy. You didn't have to bring up his lameness. You didn't have to bring up his brokenness. You didn't have to bring up his messed up state. Sometimes we're so good at giving descriptions that we feel to find others, but we soon forget that his mercy covered my lameness and his blood covered my sin. I'm done today. I want the church to pray with me. I'm reaching for somebody in this house. You're not here by accident. You're not here by coincidence. You're not alone in your brokenness. You're not alone in your lameness. I don't know what's going on in your world right now. Sir, I don't know what you're facing. Ma'am, I don't know what you're feeling right now. But I know what I feel today is there are individuals under the sound of my voice that you feel like you've gone too far and you've made too many mistakes, that you've given up your seat at the table, you're an outcast, and the king's arms aren't open to you. But I've come to tell you today, as they begin to play, they begin to sing. The king's got arms that are wide open. And he's saying, come on home. Come on, daughter. Come on, son. I'm going to adopt you. I'm going to graft you. You're going to be my son and my daughter. The king's been drawing you today. You don't know what you've been feeling. You don't know what that tug is. Let me tell you what it is. The king is standing on the balcony of heaven saying, that's me. Won't you come? Let me cover your lameness today. Let me cover your brokenness today. I'm opening this altar this morning, this area down front. Let him cover you. Let him cover your past with mercy. But the only way is for somebody to step out and be honest and be transparent and say, God, I failed. I've made too many mistakes. I'm sorry if you'll forgive me. 
I'll turn from my sin today. Come on, sir. Why don't you come today? Let the blood be applied to your life. Come on, ma'am. Why don't you forget about who's watching you? Step out from where you are. You haven't done too much. You haven't gone too far. His arms are open today. Oh, that's him. Find somebody to pray with today. I feel mercy in this house. I feel mercy in this house today. I feel the love of God in this house. Let that tablecloth of mercy cover your imperfections. Let it cover your past. Let it cover your mistakes. Let it cover your lameness today. That's it, sir. That's it, ma'am. There's a seat with your name on it. There's a seat with your name on it. was the Would you cover me today? Hallelujah. 